Welcome to the Prospective Doctor Podcast, brought to you by Med School Coach. Each week, we cover topics related to the pre med journey to medical school and beyond, from the MCAT to completing your application, and from starting medical school to choosing a specialty. Our podcast will provide essential information for anyone contemplating a career in medicine. All right, everyone. So, welcome to another session, another master course for the Pre Med Virtual Summit. My name is Max with Pre Med Made Simple. And I'm so excited for our next guest here. So today we're joined by Dr. Ed Lipset, who's a radiologist with extensive experience in admissions consulting and is currently a master advisor for Med School Coach. So Dr. Lipset, I'm really happy to have you on here. Oh, well, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. So really our goal today is we're hoping to provide a longitudinal view of the entire med school application process, really starting from the primary application and working all the way through to the point where hopefully you've ultimately cho- chosen your medical school. Now, one quick, quick disclaimer before we start diving in, we're going to cover everything very superficially. We're going to talk about a lot of topics that really could be a master class completely in and of themselves. And so mostly we're going to keep this conversation very superficial, but we'll take some occasional deep dives as well, just as um, Dr. Lipset and I are talking. So Dr. Lipset, my first question for you is let's start with the primary application. So what exactly is the primary application to med school? Okay. Well, when people are anticipating going to medical school, uh, there's an application process and it's quite long and arduous and uh, in some respects uh, complicated. There are multiple components, and it's always in the best interest of the applicant to anticipate this um, because, believe it or not, the application cycle actually begins about 18 months prior to actually entering medical school. It is a long process, um, and sometimes preparation occurs even earlier. Let me me give you an example. Well, firstly, um, one thing that makes it a little easier is that there are three central application services that the applicant must know about. Um, there's the AMCAS service, which is the American Medical Application Service, and they are a central repository or an application service for allopathic medical schools. They, they open their doors in June the year prior to matriculation. Okay, that's when they start accepting the primary applications. Now, Texas goes its own way for some reason. <laughs> actually, they actually their system was a, was a precursor to AMCAS, so they were even earlier. It's called the TMDSAS, Texas Medical Dental Application Service. They actually accept applications for the uh, Texas medical schools in May of the year prior to matriculation. Hmm. And all of the medical schools in Texas, with the exception of Baylor, uh, function through the TD, uh, TMDSAS. Uh, Baylor uses the AMCAS. And then the third service is called the AACOMAS, or the American Association of Colleges of Osteopathic Medicine. So there are uh, a fair number of osteopathic medical schools uh, granting the DO degree which is an excellent track to become a physician, but they have their own application service. And again, they start accepting their applications uh, in May uh, of the year prior to matriculation. Mm -hmm. Now, why does the uh, applicant need to prepare uh, and know all about this? Well, you know, preparation can include course selection, uh, appropriate activities to put into their primary application, and letters of reference. So let's talk a little bit about the primary application and the the components, because that's important to know about. So the primary application consists of uh, transcripts, undergraduate and graduate transcripts. And what's uh, important to know, again, here's something that needs to be anticipated. Each school has its own required coursework that needs to be completed in order to matriculate in their school. It's fairly standardized, but there are some small differences from school to school. So it's important for the individual to go to the website and anticipate the course selection, the courses that they need to complete. It's usually a good idea to have those uh, prerequisites completed at the time of the application, although if you anticipate uh, taking those courses, sometimes you'll get a provisional acceptance, provided that you do well in those uh, required courses. 
Uh, but it's usually a good idea to t- try to take as many of those as possible ahead of time. Then, of course, there's the MCAT score, uh, Medical College Admissions Test, and that's very, very important. And the GPA, which shows what you've accomplished during the course of your uh, undergraduate or graduate work. And to be honest, those metrics, the GPA and the MCAT, they're critical. And one reason is that medicine is a very popular career. And many of these schools, they are receiving 10,000 or more applications. There are some schools that are actually receiving 14,000 applications for 200 seats. And the, the the competition is keen. So even though these schools talk about looking at the individual and being holistic in their approach, yes, but only if you get past initial screening. You know, they they can't really evaluate. Uh, They're they're inundated with applications. So they use the MCAT and they use the GPA as an initial screening tool. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. So even if you you don't hit that threshold MCAT or GPA, your your story, your amazing personal statement, not even going to get looked at, right? Well, you could write like Hemingway, and it's not going to help you because no, nobody's reading it. And you know, it's it's cold and it's harsh, but it's the truth. So what you need to do is have superior metrics so that they will take your application seriously, and they'll really they'll they'll go to the next level. They'll read your personal statement. They'll look at your activities. So let's talk about the other components. So let's say you've made it through. You've made it through that threshold. Uh, You have good metrics. Well, there's a personal statement that's very open-ended. Will you talk about yourself? Um, The personal statement usually is completed towards the end when you're applying uh, because there may be a, a, a personal accomplishments, things that you want to tell the admissions committee, um, and you're, you're forming your ideas and your opinions. So that's usually a little later in the process. But what's earlier in the process and what you have to anticipate is an activities list. Mm-hmm. The activities list uh, it contains up to 15 activities, mm-hmm. and they want specific categories Uh, They want uh, activities, experiences that fill categories that include volunteer work. It could be medical volunteer work, such as um, working in a working in a free clinic. Uh, Maybe you go on a a, a medical mission. Uh, It could be non-medical, such as working in a food kitchen, maybe in a senior citizen center. So they want to see they want to make sure that you're altruistic. So volunteer work is critical. Um, Sometimes people ask me, well, well, how many hours? And they'll go online and they'll see 40 or 50. I use the triple digit rule, I have to tell you. Mm -hmm. I like the triple digits in these key activity areas. So you have to plan ahead. You have to prepare. So we have our volunteer work. It shows that you're altruistic. Next, medically related activities. It shows Mm -hmm. that uh, you know what you're getting yourself into. And also, you perhaps have patient contact, you're a good communicator, a good listener. Um, So there are qualities that are associated with medically related activities. Now, they could be passive, which is shadowing. And again, I I love to see triple digits where individuals have shadowed uh, multiple physicians. And again, that way it shows shows the committee that you, you understand what it is to be a doctor, to be a physician. And you know what you're getting yourself into because, remember, one of the great disappointments or failures of an admissions committee is when they accept someone with very good credentials, but it's a bad fit. Okay, mm-hmm. it's, bad. it's bad for the applicant. They're unhappy. Uh, it's bad for the school. It's bad for the patients. They don't want anybody who three, four, five years down the line go, oh, my goodness, what did I get myself into? So they're screening for that. And if you've done uh, significant shadowing and you're convinced that you want to be a physician, then they're comfortable and and they they believe that you know what you're getting yourself into. Mm -hmm. Now, there's also active medically related activities, and they put a premium on this, such as being an EMT, perhaps working in an ER or a clinic, being a scribe, uh, so those are more active activities, and they love to see that. Next, teaching or tutoring. Now, 
interestingly, sometimes an applicant will say to me, well, why is that so important? Why are they asking for teaching experience? Because I'm not going to go into academic medicine. Mm -hmm. But they miss the point. The point is that you're always teaching. Even if you're in a, a solo practitioner in a, in, a, in a clinic and you have a patient sitting across the table from you, you're teaching. It is more paternalistic medicine where I'm the doctor, you're the patient. I went to medical school, you didn't do what I say. Yeah. Fortunately, that's gone. Now we use terms like empowerment, partnering with patients, getting them mm -hmm. to invest in their own care. You never ask an individual to do something that they don't understand. So you're always educating. So they want to see, have you been a, have you tutored? Have you been a teacher? And it could be anything from, 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 uh, from being a, a, a teaching assistant at the kindergarten level to uh, being a TA or, uh, or teaching a course. They want to make sure that, that you can teach, you can instruct, you can communicate effectively. Next, research. Now, sometimes people say to me, well, why is that important? Again, you know, I'm going to go into clinical medicine. Why is research important? Well, there are skills that you develop as a researcher. First of all, you see the connection between research and clinical practice. We use the term evidence-based medicine. So uh, having, a, a, having a research experience, it, it broadens your perspective. It also means that you can collaborate well. You can communicate with others. You can work in a team setting. And then finally, there are probably researchers on the committee. So quite frankly, you have to make sure that uh, they're satisfied as well. Now, the research can be basic science. In fact, it could be almost mind-numbing basic science. Or it can be clinical, clinical uh, uh, research. But the fact that you've, you've worked in a team setting and you've collaborated, that, that tells the committee a lot about you. So uh, that's important, research. Leadership. Now, not just being a member of something, but maybe you're an officer of a club or a society. Maybe you founded an organization. Maybe you did a food drive uh, or you collected clothes for the homeless. There are many ways to fill that, that category, but it shows that you're more than just a follower. You're a leader. Mm -hmm. Now, honors, awards, publications, that speaks for itself. Yeah. But again, this is something that you can't do last minute. This is to be anticipated. So if you know these categories exist, you can plan, especially during the course of either your undergraduate uh, career or gap time. Let me talk just for a moment about gap time. That's becoming increasingly common. Maybe 20 years ago, the traditional applicant went straight from uh, uh, undergraduate school to medical school. Now, increasingly, more and more students, accepted students, have gap time. And gap time can be a terrific thing. Um, you become more mature, of course. You see more, you do more. Uh, you're not in school anymore. And you can add meaningful activities uh, you know, to your application. So it's not for everyone, but individuals who uh, take gap time, I think that's being considered more and more conventional or traditional and certainly nothing unusual. Yeah, absolutely. And if I could just add one thing, um, if anyone's interested in learning some more about gap time, um, Dr. Marinelli, who's actually one of the peers of Dr. Lipsit um, at Med School Coach, um, we did a full 30 to 45 minute session specifically on gap years. So we take a much, much deeper dive overall into that topic. Great. And uh, one other thing about gap time, although I know you've gone over it already, is that sometimes there are soft spots in the application and they can be filled during a productive year or two of gap time. Uh, and again, a, a thorough review of the primary application uh, is usually a good idea uh, so that one can be sure that they're prepared and ready and they have a competitive application. Extracurricular activities. What makes you interesting? Um, uh, diversity uh, is a, uh, the D word, is, is, is paramount. And they, they love to have people entering the medical school class that bring something to the table. It could be a, a unique talent. It could be an interesting hobby. It could be uh, an area uh, of interest, perhaps. Or maybe it can be um, a, a major that wasn't uh, necessarily science-related. could be public health, business, finance. Uh, so... Many times schools love to have diversity within their class, and that can include extracurricular activities, talents, and interests. Okay, so that's, that's the activities list. And 
That is to be anticipated. For the uh, AMCAS application, interestingly, three of the activities are to be designated as most meaningful. Mm. And for those, the applicant, generally with with these activities, in the primary application, it's simply a, a brief description of the activity. When you did the activity, how long did it last, how many hours did you put in, and then a few sentences describing the activity. But for three of them, they're called most meaningful, and there you have to add a paragraph or two where you indicate why this was transformative, why it was so important that it contributed to your uh, interest in medicine and it was crucial to your development. So three of those activities. Okay, now let's move on to the letters of recommendation. Dr. Lipset, do you mind if I just ask you to follow up on those most meaningful? Do you have any recommendations for how you can pick the most meaningful activities? Is it truly just what meant the most to you? Or should you be picking some, um, some maybe a clinical activity plus a research activity? What would you recommend? That is a great question. It's asked often. And my simple answer is it should be most meaningful to you because they're asking for the most meaningful. Um, it's important not to be manipulative in your application, not to provide answers that you think a committee would want. Uh, you need to be honest and sincere. And I generally advise individuals, unless, in my opinion, I think the activity sounds trivial, um, short of that, I like them to choose it. Because a general comment, though, I do believe that activities that are either altruistic, volunteer work, um, medically related, uh, or uh, teaching and research. I think th- those activities are probably, um, the, they have the most gravitas, mm. and, and I think they'll be seen as being uh, um, truly important in the development of the individual. So volunteer work, medically related, teaching and research. Um, now, having said that, though, there are applicants who have very, very interesting extracurricular activities. It could be uh, sports. Uh, it could be um, uh, maybe musically related. Um, some passion. Um, that's not a bad idea to include that as one of the three. I wouldn't have extracurricular activities as all three. But a very nice uh, a selection would be a volunteer activity, a medically related activity, and then let's say an extracurricular activity that is extraordinary in some way. So as I, I'm kind of gearing up for residency interviews on my end. And so one thing that we're constantly advised to do, which reminds me very much of what you just said, is that sometimes you need to put things on your application as essentially interview fodder. Like you basically just need to show the committee that you're a normal human being. You're not just a machine or a robot who just studies all the time. You need to be able to show that you're going to connect to patients. And I think those kind of extracurricular experiences are a really nice way to do that. Yeah, uh, generally, in my interview experience, I love to pick up on uh, an extracurricular activity that, by reading the personal statement and the most meaningful activities, I know, I can tell that that activity is extraordinarily important to that individual. And I love to talk about that. Usually, they're, they're, um, their eyes light up, and they're very animated, and they love to talk about those activities because they are literally most meaningful. Mm. So, um, and, but again, you know, that's, I think that's one of the roles of, a, of an advisor uh, and that uh, basically applicants will, uh, they'll sort of bounce off me um, of these various activities and I'll get my opinion as to what's most meaningful, at least as, as far as I'm concerned. But ultimately, I usually look them in the eye and say, but what was most meaningful for you? Yeah. Okay. And then just one more quick follow-up about the activities. So you talked about the three most meaningful, and then I believe you said earlier there's 15 slots for experiences. Do you recommend that students have to fill up those 15 spots? I actually do. Mm-hmm. Um, it, those, those, it, it's not so much the 15, but it's each category. I hate to see a category left blank because, to be honest, well, I'll have applicants, they, they say to me, Dr. Lipset, I just don't know what the committees want. What are they looking for? And I say, it's an open book test. They're telling you. By giving you these categories, they are telling you what they're looking for, what they would like to see. 
So leaving categories blank or open uh, is generally not a good idea. Uh, I like people to have 15 activities, but if they have 13 or 14, but the, but but they have a significant activity within each of the categories, yeah. I think they're fine. And, you know, at the committee level, quite honestly, I have seen um, candidates with good credentials be deferred um, because they the committee was concerned that a particular uh, category of activity was simply not being filled. Mm. Okay. So it's very important to have one thing from every category that you're kind of walking us through right now. I think that's a great idea. Get those categories are there for a reason. These were thought out. They weren't just, you know, it wasn't serendipity. Uh, yeah. You know, got together or uh, certainly, you know, these various uh, primary application services, they get together and they say, what are we looking for in these candidates above and beyond their metrics? So mm -hmm. they're asking you, they're really telling you uh, what they need to see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, m moving on to another area that's really, really important and must be anticipated are the letters of recommendation. Our mission is to inspire, encourage, and inform students as you journey through a rigorous and intricate process of achieving your dreams in medicine. Visit us at prospectivedoctor.com and medschoolcoach.com for more essential resources in your medical school journey and beyond.